The portion of God's word that we'll focus our hearts on this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. Let's begin with prayer. O Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Blessed is one of those words that gets thrown around pretty haphazardly these days. I'm sure all of us have heard somebody rattle off a long laundry list of all the really good things that they've got going on in their life. And they start to throw on the end of it. I'm just so incredibly blessed. And that word, blessed, it, it flows off of our lips so easily that we really apply it to a lot of different circumstances of life. Everything from major milestones like marriage all the way down to the, the monotonous everyday things like a good meal. So blessed. So much so that in the language of social media, hashtag blessed has kind of taken over for the period as the preferred punctuation we use to close out our thoughts. It all ends with hashtag blessed. And people use that, everybody from the Super Bowl MVP to the recovering addict to the mom whose child finally slept through the night for the first time. They describe their life as blessed. But with all those different people and all those different circumstances saying that their life is blessed, I think there's one common thread that ties all those blesseds together. And that is we feel and we express that we are blessed in our life when all the, the outward physical circumstances seem to be going in a positive way, just the way that we want them to. We say, right, we are so blessed. And that's probably why you rarely hear somebody talk about all the ways that that they lost their job, they lost their health, or they've lost a loved one, and close it out by saying, I'm just so blessed. You don't see somebody post about how their life is, is falling apart right before their eyes and close it out with a hashtag blessed. And it's not surprising, right? Because in this world, we see blessedness as something that's contingent upon happiness, as something contingent upon circumstances going the way that we want them to go. This isn't a new thought. In ancient Greece, they had a word for this, makarios, which we would translate today as blessed, as happy, as fortunate. Makarios in the Greek was always used in the same context. It was attached to the idea that the person had some sort of a physical outward good, be it wealth or power or fame. And even the Jews in Jesus' day had that same kind of thinking, that the people who were really rich, the people who really had a lot of good things going on in their lives, they were the ones that God was blessing. But the people who were poor or the suffering, they were the ones that were being cursed by God. And so it must have really been surprising to the crowds that were gathered around Jesus when he used that exact same Greek word, makarios, to describe people as blessed that the entire rest of the world would say was the exact opposite of blessed. We call this the, the Sermon on the Mount, the Savior's Sermon, as we're calling it in this series. And this Sermon on the Mount is probably one of the best known, if not the most well-known sermon that's ever been preached. And in it, Jesus shares with his disciples important truths about what it means to be his disciple. Now, at this point, when Jesus preaches the Sermon on the Mount, he's collected a handful of his disciples to follow him. He started his ministry of preaching and teaching and healing in the area around the Sea of Galilee in the northern part of Israel. And as the word was getting around about this Jesus guy who could heal people of their diseases, this teacher who taught with a, an authority that none of the other teachers had, the crowds were flocking to see him from all over Israel and even beyond. And so one day as Jesus sees the crowds gathering around to see him and to hear him, he goes up on a mountainside this is pre-microphone, so he wants to find a good acoustical place where his voice will be carrying so that the crowds can hear it. He sits down on the mountainside, which is what teachers in that day did when they taught. They sat, surrounded by his disciples. And again, this isn't just the 12 that we normally think about. This is a multitude of people that had started following Jesus and, and listening to his teaching. Surrounded by his disciples, Jesus begins to preach. And the words he says, like we said, are probably pretty shocking. And we call these first 12 verses of the Sermon on the Mount, what we're looking at in our sermon today, the Beatitudes, from a Latin word, 
beati, which means blessed. And we call them that because in these statements called the Beatitudes, Jesus is laying out for us what it truly means to be blessed. But to Jesus' audience, it probably seemed kind of backwards. To us, even, it probably seems kind of backwards. Because Jesus calls people that are blessed that we would say are, are the exact opposite. Jesus calls types of people the makarioi, the blessed ones, that we would never see that way. Listen to some of the, the groups of people that Jesus says are blessed. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Sounds backwards, right? Because in the world, we think the people that are blessed are the ones that are powerful, the ones that are wealthy, the ones that are influential. The people are blessed, the ones that their life seems to be going perfectly according to the map for their life that they've sketched out in their heads. The people that are blessed are the ones that have everything they could ever want, and their life is lived in a way that just makes them happy at all times. Those are people that are blessed, at least in our eyes. But Jesus basically says the exact opposite is true. That the blessed ones are not the rich and the powerful influencers of the world, not those that are perfectly satisfied with the outward circumstances of their lives. No, Jesus says the ones that are blessed are the weak. The ones that are lacking and deficient in some way. The ones that can't rely on their own strength. So Jesus says things that sound kind of backwards. The weak. The deficient, those that the world would see as, as pushovers, as, as disrespected doormats. They're the ones that are blessed. But again, how does that make sense? Why would Jesus call people like that blessed? Let's take a look and see exactly what Jesus says in this Beatitudes to figure it out. What does he mean? And Jesus in these Beatitudes, he starts out each of them with the phrase, blessed are. And then he follows through by describing a certain characteristic or attribute of a group of people. And then he ends it by saying why those specific groups of people are blessed. Now, in, in the Bible scholarship today, you'll hear a couple of different ways of, of interpreting the Beatitudes. Some look at them with the kind of a, a moralistic viewpoint. I've even heard a preacher once refer to the Beatitudes as the B-attitudes. As in, these are the attitudes that you need to have. These are the things that you ought to be so that you can be blessed. As if the Beatitudes are all about Jesus saying, if you can do these things, if you can be these things and have this kind of attitude in your life, then I will bless you. As if blessedness is a, a carrot on a stick that Jesus dangles out in front of us and says, uh, you just have to be a little more poor in spirit. Just be a little bit more merciful. Be a little bit better of a peacemaker. And then, and then I will bless you then I will give you blessings according to the world's definition of blessing. But that moralistic attitude of the be attitudes, it, it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense when you actually look at what Jesus says in the Beatitudes. For example, look at the first Beatitude that Jesus says. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Being poor in spirit doesn't exactly sound like a really blessed position to be in, does it? doesn't really sound like a positive to be poor in spirit. And it gets maybe even a little bit worse when you understand that poor maybe isn't even the best translation of this. The Greek word literally means to be a beggar. Blessed are the beggars. Really? Would we feel that way? Blessed are the beggars? Talk about backwards, right? So what exactly is Jesus saying as he says this? It's important to understand, important to note that Jesus says, blessed are the poor, the beggars in spirit. That means he's not saying if you have physical wealth, if you have physical blessings in your life, you're cut off from all blessing. Nor does it mean he's saying that if you don't have physical wealth and goods in your life, that you are cut off from blessing. Rather, Jesus is saying that the poor in spirit, the beggars in spirit, in their spiritual lives, they are the ones who are blessed. Think about what that means. Think about a beggar. 
I've never met a beggar who sits on the street corner and shares a big long laundry list of all the accomplishments that they've done in their lives, all the good things that they have brought forth that you ought to be rewarding them for. Now, if a person is truly a beggar, they understand that there is nothing that they bring to the table. They understand that all they can do is throw themselves down at the feet of the mercy and the grace and the generosity of another person who can give to them what they don't have and what they can't supply for themselves. A beggar is someone that understands how dependent they are on someone else. And so Jesus says here, blessed are the beggars in spirit. That's why Jesus is not saying to us, do these things and you will be blessed. He's saying the exact opposite. He's saying it's not about what you can say. This is the reasons I've done all these things, so therefore God ought to bless me. Being a spiritual beggar means you understand that you bring nothing spiritually to the table that should cause God to reward you or bless you in some way. See, a spiritual beggar means that you throw yourselves down at the feet of God, entirely dependent on, on His strength and His mercy and His grace to supply what you need. So blessed are the beggars. When Martin Luther, the great reformer, died, he found a piece of paper in his pocket, and on that piece of paper were written a number of different things in German, but the last thing he wrote on that piece of paper in German was this. We are beggars. This is true. You see, when you understand the law that shows us our sin and our failures, and you understand the gospel, that we have a Savior who came for us out of complete grace, we understand that we are spiritual beggars, that we bring nothing to the table. How completely dependent we are to throw ourselves down at the feet of Jesus and trust that He is our strength. And really, when you look at it, every single one of the Beatitudes that Jesus says here all carry through the same basic point. That Jesus says the ones who are truly blessed are the ones who are weak. The ones who are lacking in some way. The ones that are entirely reliant on someone else in order to have what they need. The poor in spirit, like we've been talking about. Those who mourn. And not just talking about people who mourn because someone that they love has died. We're talking about people who mourn over their sin, mourn over their failures, mourn over all of the, the disgusting and broken consequences of, of living in a sinful world, mourn over the sadness that we see all around us and the ugliness that we see inside of us because of our sin. Blessed are the meek. Not the people that are bold, not the ones that take power and control into their own hands and lord it over everyone else so they can have the kind of blessed life that they want for themselves. No, the meek, the passive, the ones that the world looks at and says, that's a pushover that I can use for my own advantage. They don't have any strength of their own. They put their trust in the strength of another. Blessed are the merciful. Those who don't hang on to the opportunities that they can lord power and revenge over somebody else to control them, but those who are willing to give forgiveness and show mercy because they trust that God is the one that's going to carry out justice and they know the mercy that God has shown to them. Those that hunger, for thir hunger, hunger and thirst for righteousness. Those that have a deep longing, desire, and need for for righteousness, for the things that God says are good and right, and yet at the same time are humble beggars who know that the only way we can have that thirst and hunger satisfied is through one who is righteous in our place. Blessed are the pure in heart. Those who strive not to live according to their own personal standards or their own sinful nature, but who strive to live that purity that God lays out for what a holy life looks like. And yet at the same time, as a humble beggar understands that the only way we can have a pure heart is if God cleanses our sin-stained hearts. Blessed are the peacemakers. Those who don't try and seize outward power and control of their lives by attacking and backstabbing everyone else so they can work their way to the top. Blessed are the ones who pursue peace. Who pursue peace because they trust that, that God is the one that is their strength, that God is the one that will be their blessing. Blessed are those who are persecuted and insulted for their connection to Christ, those that the world looks down on as a bunch of fools and a bunch of losers. Blessed are they. You see, in every way, all of the beatitudes that Jesus shares, all of the people that Jesus says are blessed are the ones that the world would look at and say, that's not a person who's blessed. 
In every way, the people that Jesus says are blessed are the ones that to the world's standards are weak and foolish and needy, the ones who can't rely on their own strength, that can't rely on themselves, but are entirely dependent on God to be their strength, to be their help. And so to be blessed means to be a a humble, lowly, spiritual beggar who throws themselves down at the feet of God and trusts in his strength instead of their own. Now that means that in the Beatitudes, Jesus isn't saying, do these things and therefore you'll be blessed. That's the opposite of what we're seeing. Rather, in the Beatitudes, Jesus is saying, you are blessed because of these things that I have done. That blessings are not dependent on the things that you do, but blessings are dependent on the things that he has done in your place. You see, with each statement of blessedness that Jesus shares, he then follows it up and tells us why those people are blessed. Not because they did those things, but because of Jesus. Right? The, the poor in the spirit, those beggars, they are blessed because theirs is the kingdom of God. Not will be the kingdom someday, They'll have it someday when they've done enough of these things, when they've been these things and had these kind of attitudes for long enough that God will give it to them. No, right here and right now, those who trust in Jesus as their Savior, we possess the kingdom of God already. Theirs is the kingdom of God. They will be comforted. They will inherit the earth. They will be filled. They will be shown mercy. They will see God. They will be called children of God. Great is their reward in heaven. All of the reasons that these people and all those different circumstances are blessed is because of what God has done for them and what God continues to do for them. And those are all the reasons that Jesus can say to people who, in outward perspective, look like the opposite of blessed, that you are blessed. Jesus can say that about you because it's not all about you. The blessings in your life are not dependent on your actions or your emotions. The blessings that God promises are based on his actions. They're dependent on Jesus. And that's why they're so certain. That's why these are certain promises of blessedness. Because the man preaching the sermon on the mountainside didn't stay on the mountain. He came down from the mountain so that years later into his ministry he'd be able to climb up another mountain. On a mountain where a a cross was waiting. A mountain where a cross was waiting so that he could pay for the sins of the whole world so that he could rise again to give a certainty that, that the payment has been made in full. Because Jesus became that weakness for us, he can be our strength. Because Jesus sacrificed his power, he can be our power. Because Jesus gave up his greatest blessings, Jesus is your greatest blessing. You are blessed because of Jesus. And so the reality for us is, applying this to our lives, is if you look for blessedness in your life according to the the standards of the world, according to all those outward physical circumstances, then your blessedness is always going to be temporary. It's always going to be uncertain. It's always going to be shifting because it is oh so fleeting. One minute you feel oh so blessed, and the next minute it's gone. See, if you find your blessings on the things of this world, on the perspective of this world, then you're never going to be certain of your blessings. But if you find your blessings on Jesus and the work that he has done and continues to do for you, then no matter how weak you feel, no matter how hopeless or helpless your life might seem, no matter how broken you and your life seem to have become, you're blessed. You're blessed because he is your strength, because he is your hope, because he is your help, because he is the one that has made you whole. And so when you find your blessings in Christ, it means that you are blessed no matter what. And that's why when Jesus and the Christian church got a hold of that Greek word makarios, they took the meaning of it and they flipped it upside down. No longer did Macarius mean blessings associated with having outward physical good. And when the Christian church got a hold of that word, they turned the meaning into this. It's blessedness in the sense of that ultimate well-being 
and the distinctive spiritual joy of those who share in the salvation of the kingdom of God. Not blessedness based on our circumstances of life, but blessedness based on Christ. So friends, that means that no matter where you are in your life, no matter how blessed you feel, no matter how, if you want to put hashtag blessed about your life or not, you are Makario. You are the blessed ones. Because the Lord is your strength. Amen.